Hi, everyone. So I would like to talk about uh, image dynamics control for, uh, for late robots. So first, uh, before starting explaining what I want to present, so this is the work done uh, in collaboration with uh, Stefan Schaub, uh, Jonas Petri, and my chemistry, and uh, Mina Kalakrishnan. Uh, so I'm interested in motion control, so how do we move uh, robots as we control them? Uh, and if you think about the traditional way of moving a joint, uh, moving robots, if you have traditional PID control, if you want to have good tracking performances, you need high gains. If you have high gains, you have very high stiffness. And this is what happens if you have high stiffness and you have un unperceived obstacles, so not very good perception in general. Basically, you, do, uh, you can have great catastrophic uh, behavior. That's why we like very much model based control, uh, in addition to, to, to these approaches, like image dynamics, operational space control. Because if you have a model, you can predict whether the force that you need to achieve desired motion, and then you don't need very high gains to move. So usually it leads to much higher uh, tracking performance, and you have compliant control because you can use uh, very low feedback gains. And then you can deal with uh, unperceived uh, obstacles much better. So, so, so you get very interesting improvement in, uh, in, uh, in motion control. So to go very quickly over that, how does it work? Well, PID control, we know how it works. You have a desired uh, motion, desired position, uh, velocity. You have the state of the robot and you generate a torque gauge proportional to the error that you're making. Now if you have inverse dynamics, basically you have um, the desired acceleration and you have a model of the robot, so mass times acceleration, plus all the forces that, that, are, that are around, so gravity, place, etc. You can predict what are the torques that you need, um, then you can lower the, the PID gain. So essentially this is what, inverse dynamics is just feedback realization, so hopefully your robot is going to do the desired acceleration that you, that, that you want. So this is something that people use all the time in uh, manipulators. So fixed-based robots, you know that improve, we know that it improves tracking performance. You're able to lower, lower the gains and get very compliant control. Things are slightly different with egg robots because they're not manipulators, as I guess everyone knows here. Uh, we have always contact constraints that are switching all the time. So one time I have two legs on the ground, one time I have one leg on the ground. Sometimes my elbows are touching something. Sometimes, you know, I can basically touch the world with any parts of my body. So I have to take this into account. I have to have a way to, to, to deal with that. And we're unactuated. So the position of the robot with respect to the inertial frame is, is not uh, actuated, so I don't have a direct control on that. So that's the, the question. How do we how do we inverse dynamics with, uh, with, with that? So if you formulate the problem, there's a few the equations of motion. So mass times acceleration plus forces. Uh, so forces is H, is uh, gravity, Coriolis, uh, friction, all the forces you can think of is equal to the torques plus the contact forces. So the torques are under actuation, because we cannot, uh, uh, we don't have actuation at the, to, to, to move the, the, move the position of the robot with respect to the, to the standard of mass, to respect to the initial frame uh, uh, directly. And we have uh, contact forces. And with the constraints that we set is basically, uh, you have contact forces and you can, you can write a set of constraints that say, oh, uh, if my feet are on the ground, they should not move. So this is the constraint we, we consider here. So the problem is that how do we choose the torques such that I can achieve the desired motion that I want to do? So uh, how do I choose torques that I can do the desired acceleration that, I, that, I, that my client uh, asked for? Uh, a few things we would like to have is that we, we want to predict the contact forces and not measure them. So uh, you know, if you measure them, you can get rid of one unknown in, in the equation. We actually want to predict that because if you can predict uh, contact forces, then you can uh, uh, write a force control loop around that so you can, you can actually uh, do more control than if you can only measure things. And uh, we want to be robust to model uncertainty. You know, we won't never have a perfect dynamic model of your system. Uh, because we want to use that on a real robot, but actually complex robot, we cannot rely on perfect models. So the idea of my colleague Mike uh, Mystery was to, to say, okay, if we have the, the, the Jacobian, uh, we can use a Creole decomposition of the Jacobian, so we can use basically an orthogonal matrix. And if you do a little bit of math, you can realize that you can write a torque that looks like this. Uh, to achieve the desired uh, inverse dynamics. So it looks a bit complicated, actually it's super simple. The red part is what? Is mass times acceleration plus forces, so it's just the, the dynamics, we know it, we can compute that very easily. The blue part is, a, is a basically a projection in the kinematics, so we just use the QR composition of the Jacobian, and uh, so it's basically a kinematic projection. Kinematics, you know, great. we have a really good, usually very good model of the kinematics, so it's trivial to compute. And the, the green part is, a, is what I call an earth space term, uh, why? Because if you have more compact constraints than a, than a, than a degrees of actuation, actually you have more torque capabilities, torque, torque degrees of freedom, than degrees of freedom for the motion. So you can create internal forces. And this is the, 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 the green part. So it's a very simple controller. And, uh, and, and uh, it allows also to predict contact forces, so you can have an addition to force control uh, on, on top of that. 
So, so far we didn't talk about contact forces yet. In a, we don't control them, we just uh, get rid of them to compute the, the inverse uh, dynamics. The problem is that if you do that and you just try to you know, minimize like torques, uh, for example, when you, when you solve for redundancy, you don't take into account the contacts, how they look like. So if you have a robot like this, there you have contact forces that are generated in blue. If the, the, the surface is different, you're going to, to always generate the same thing, which minimizes the torques. But in this case, you know, grand rational forces are outside of corner friction, you're going to sleep. So maybe it's a good idea to try to manipulate these forces while we move. And the question is that can we use the torque redundancy to actually uh, manipulate these reaction forces? So more formally, the question is that can we optimize the cost in the contacts? So can we optimize the quality cost in the contacts and minimize it uh, by shooting a control controller that does it? So the answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in the technical details, but basically the idea is that you, you, since we have a redundancy left, you can rewrite the control law as a, as a weighted inverse by choosing a weight that looks like this. So it's just basically including the, the, the cost that we're interested in, in in the weight, and same thing for the for the for the internal torque. Basically, we can prove that uh, we get a, a minimum of this function, so an optimal distribution of the constraints of the contact constraints at every time step. So we plan, uh, at each time the controller the controller is sending a control command to, to to the robot. So what can we do with that? Well, now in this case, uh, since I can take into account my contacts and I can manipulate them now when my Ground is, is changing shape. I can manipulate my forces so that stay in the, in the in the friction cone, so I don't see it anymore. If you think of a robot that is, a, for example, on a step like this, you can start to distribute the weight between the two legs without moving. You don't move. You just sense basically the, the tension that you have between your legs. And you can redistribute the weight. So you can imagine what you, what you can do if you start to do that to, for example, climb steps or start to do very complicated uh, multi-contact motions. Uh, so this is an example with a, a simulation with a little dog. So. The upper part is uh, the inverse dynamics that tries to minimize uh, tangential forces, so to, to minimize slipping. And the lower part is uh, when we do the typical inverse dynamics by just minimizing torque, the overall torque uh, uh, that, that you generate. So we use the exact same plan. So it's exactly the same uh, desired trajectory if you want. The only difference is how do we pick up the torques uh, to, to generate the motion. And if you look at this, you say that by, just, by not changing the planning, by not changing the way we move, we can, by, by just by playing with the forces that we create as contacts, we can actually climb slopes that we will not be able to do otherwise. Well. So that, that, that shows that actually it, it matters a lot. It's not sufficient to minimize torques. We, we, we need to do uh, more than that. And this is an example, so a systematic test. If you compare with a, the optimal inverse dynamics, <coughs> the normal inverse dynamics will minimize torques. And just a high gain PD control uh, for different coefficient of static friction, the, the average slip, you see that uh, basically uh, we don't sleep uh, with this new way of, 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 of controlling uh, the robot while, you, while as the coefficient of friction becomes low, uh, low, we start to sleep a lot with, with uh, different uh, other uh, control schemes. So it works also on the real robot. So this is the little dot robot that we, we had at USC. Uh, up the same optimal inverse dynamics, low uh, the, the normal one. Uh, they're synchronized, so you can see that the, the red uh, the, the legs are doing the same thing at the same time. It's just a mirror symmetry. When I make the video, you see things are not right. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time, but uh, you can see that first uh, the, the, the new controller works on the real robot, so the robot is doing what it's supposed to do. It's the same planner for both, so we, we ask for the same desired uh, motion. Uh, the only difference is basically what are the torques that we use to, to actually uh, do this motion. And you can see that on the upper part, uh, the robot is actually reaching the top uh, of, the, of the slope uh, faster. Why? Because it's doing the same motion, because it's not sleeping. It's sleeping much less than the other one. So you're going to tell me, okay, this is, this is not super impressive, uh, which I agree with you. Um, uh, I cannot show you something when one robot falls and the other one is not. There's a few explanations for that. Uh, well, we have a very slow control bandwidth, only 100 hertz. We can send control uh, only at 100 hertz on this robot. Uh, on a properly talk control platform, like, um, I don't know, Sarkos Humanity, you get at least a kilohertz. So, you know, we should get much better performance. Uh, we don't have any torque sensing. Uh, so, we basically, it's conversion from a desired torque to current, and then you hope that things are right. But if you can close a, uh, uh, a feedback loop around the torque, then you should get a better, better performance. Same with um, modern torque control platforms, usually you can do that. And most of the dynamics of this robot is dominated by friction. Friction, you cannot redistribute over your joints. Friction, you have to compensate at the exact the joint where you have friction. So more than 50% of the torque that actually is sent to the robot is compensated for the friction, so it's useless. You cannot use that to, 
play with the, with the contact. So again, if you have a better robot, things can only get better. So I think it's a pretty cool result for that. that it shows that even with a, with a, with a not so ideal robot, we already get uh, a behavioral differences. And I guess I'm done, which is good. Uh, my conclusion is that, uh, well, the next step is basically to try that on, on, on this robot. And um, my conclusion is very simple. I think that sometimes we overlook uh, the importance of, of using good top controllers. And it's very important, and it actually makes a huge difference uh, if you want to start to do high performance things. Thank you. So there's one question here. Uh, I, may have, I may have misinterpreted something that you said, but it, it, said, it sounded like in the middle of the talk you said that uh, if you can predict forces, you can do better control than if you can measure them. And then later in your talk you said, little dog doesn't have torque sensing, we have to go through currents, and we could do better if we had torque sensing. So how can you resolve this, uh, this discrepancy? Where oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I, I, so I, did, I didn't, I didn't, uh, okay, it's, it's amazing something. I, I, so what I meant is that if you want to solve the, for the inverse dynamics, uh, you know, if you have these unknown forces, so either you measure them, so if you have force sensors, for example, at the end effector, which we have with the, with the little dog, uh, then you can, uh, you can remove these forces, so maybe let me go back to the, to, the, to the equation here. Basically, when you have contact forces, you have an unknown that you, you have to resolve. So either you resolve the unknown uh, nitrically, or you, you put your measurement in. If you put your measurement, you, cannot, you, you will not be able to predict them. So if you don't predict, you know the contact force that you have in the other vector, uh, well, if you can predict them, basically you can, you, can, um, you can then, and if you have a measurement of this force, then you can add a force control loop on top of that, on top of the inverse dynamics control loop. So it's not part of it, it's something we can add to, to improve actually the, the, the locomotion. To go back to the little dog, the little dog we have force sensing at the, at the end effector. It's not really good, but it gives you uh, some information on whether or not you're, you're touching. But we don't have load cells at the joints, so we cannot close a, a torque feedback loop at every joint. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, clearly. So, so that's the thing that we. So at UC we just received the Sarkos humanoid, and uh, so that's the plan to implement these these things uh, on the Sarkos humanoid. So I'm currently doing that. Uh, I don't have yet the things to show. Hopefully next time I'm uh, But yeah, yeah, of course. That, so that was the whole the whole idea of this research is to, to realize that I make this. I mean, we're doing similar research on the in the importance of actually manipulating contacts in addition to doing other things. So, so yeah, hopefully I can show you more things in a, in a few months. Yeah. Andy? I, I, I guess the question for you and a more general question, which is for all the control loops that people have, whether it's on a hot, long time scale, short time scale, and let's say you do a model for your control, you send out, you do a calculation, you set out an open loop command for a while, and then update it by model for your control or whatever else. Uh, that <coughs> The given control can be expressed as position as a function of time, torque as a function of time, uh, velocity as a function of time. Uh, it, you know, it may be different, it may be the same, you can't have different position, uh, as a function of line control, or so on. So the Boston Dynamics people said they have in their low level control between the update uh, some kind of compliant control. They didn't say how they pick their stiffness and so on. But uh, I feel like you, you know, people say model predictive control, and simply the given model predictive algorithm will have very different behavior depending on whether you put out torque versus time or position yeah. versus time. And this is what you're talking about, I guess. That yeah, so that's exactly that. Say that the, the controller is going to matter. It's not only if you if your MVC <coughs> framework gives you a, a position uh, as a function of time. Then you know the way you're going to actually generate the torque is going to. That's what I wanted to show you. That actually does matter if you find torques as a function of time. And I have to admit that I, I don't have a fixed answer on, on what's the best way of doing these things because I guess you can get a lot of things out of, of the pure force control. You can get a lot of things by doing this curved torque control, but adding uh, you know desired positions or desired basically position profiles. Whether it's desired force profile, desired impedance, desired position profile is the best. I, I honestly, I don't have an answer, and I don't think anyone has, has the answer of that. It's going to well, be kind of like that. Maybe some of the something you can say that anybody can do systematic investigation of that issue for their controller. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's not that 
that's as you get, that's something that we're actually actively trying to think of what's the best way of, of comparing these different types of approaches because I, I don't have an answer of what's the right way of doing this thing. Yeah, it's a very important question. Thank you very much. Thank you.